Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel. Now for the past two weekends I have done videos on the trenches on the Western Front in the First World War. Now if you've not seen those um, videos yet I'll leave links to them in the description down below. And I thought today, keeping in that theme, I would look at one of the two most, two weapons that most defined a soldier's experience on the Western Front. Now I'm not going to look at artillery, which was the biggest killer during the war, but I'm going to look at the machine gun. It's one of the most iconic weapons um, of battle um, on the Western Front. Now in the early 1880s, Hiram Maxim, an American, invented the first true automatic machine gun as we know them today. It used the power of the recoil of it firing to eject that spent round and bring the next one into the breach and as long as a soldier kept his finger on that firing button that gun would carry on firing. This is in contrast to what you might say an earlier machine gun like the Gatling gun which used a hand crank to basically operate the mechanism. It was manually operated. Same as a bolt action rifle is manually operated to uh, load and eject each round. The machine gun was automatic. Um, and in the late 1880s and early 1890s, because I'm looking at this from the perspective of the German and British armies, both these nations adopted that Maxim machine gun and used them in their colonial campaigns during the scramble for Africa. And when you get up to the First World War, when the outbreak of the First World War, both these armies that were using the Maxim gun have adapted and adopted that gun for their own armies. The Germans themselves created the Machine Gun of Air 08 in 1908, which is where it gets the 08 um, special, uh, number from. It is basically a bog standard Maxim gun. They've not really altered it at all. The British, on the other hand, in 1912, um, created the iconic Vickers machine gun. This gun was um, in service with the British Army and other armies for two world wars and right up into the 1960s. It's such a brilliant heavy machine gun. Now both these guns look very similar because they are very similar and their specs are almost identical. Um, they're both water cooled. You can see the barrel here and then you've got this um, jacket round the barrel which holds about three or four pints of water because when a machine gun fires, like any gun fires, it's creating heat. Now when you've got an automatic firing gun, like a machine gun, that heat is increasing all the time. So these big heavy machine guns um, need the barrel cooling. So they have this jacket round uh, filled with water and when it boiled off it would go down the tube and condense into the uh, container below and you had to keep topping this up. Um, they are belt fed. The ammunition is fed through on a belt which um, holds 250 rounds per belt. When that's run out you have to put another belt in. Um, rate of fire of both these guns was between 450 and 500 rounds per minute. Maximum range, um, no, actually I shouldn't say maximum, the effective range of both these guns was about 2,000 metres. Maximum range varied a little bit. The, um, the Vickers had a maximum range in an ammunition of about 4,000 metres, whereas the MG08 had a max, uh, maximum range of about 3,700. So they are very, very similar. The biggest difference between these two guns comes with the weight of them. The Vickers gun, all up, overall, as that picture was, weighs about 40 kilograms. The MG08 weighs about 65 kilograms. Um, and most of that weight, 40 kilograms of it, is in the sled that it sits on. It's a really heavy, heavy duty sled. And to move these guns around, German um, soldiers will often put them on two wheel carts and, and, and drag them along to get them moving around. Um, you can see it's a really heavy duty sled as, compa as compared to the Vickers, which is like a tripod. That still weighed about 23 kilograms. Um, but yeah, that's the biggest difference. Um, both armies had tried to lighten the Maxim gun. Um, the British were more successful 
by messing around with the mechanism here, they managed to take a lot of weight off it. But it's still a heavy gun. And that brings us to its offensive role. It's not really a machine gun that can keep up with an advance, not a fast advance as we know it in the first, in your big, when you're leading up to the years of the First World War, where you're wanting to charge across um, a field to get to your enemy. You can use them offensively, stick them on the flanks of your attack to fire at your enemy, but they can't really keep up with a fast advance. Their real um, advantage is in the defence. Now, when we think of the SOB, we think of machine guns cutting down swathes of men as they're crossing no man's land. And that brings me to a point. Let me just put this down a second. That brings me to a point. You often see in sources, in books about the First World War, that um, the Germans had, at the beginning of the war, thousands of machine guns. and The British had two machine guns per battalion. A massive discrepancy in how many uh, machine guns each side had. And this is because it, it's, it's thought that the British high command didn't see the machine gun as an important weapon, was slow, they were short-sighted, slow to adopt it. Well, let's give this a little bit of scrutiny. Um, in August 1914, when war broke out, the British Expeditionary Force in France contained 72 battalions with two machine guns per battalion, so 144 machine guns with the BEF. The Germans, on the other hand, had 1,700 machine guns. But they also had 288 regiments on the whole of the Western Front. Now, a regiment in the German army contained, um, had six machine guns with it. But a regiment contained three battalions. So you break it down, each battalion still has two machine guns. It's just that the German army is much bigger and they are distributed among the units differently. Whereas two machine guns in a British battalion were embedded with the battalion, a German regiment of three battalions had a machine gun company separate to a separate company. So these six machine guns were in their own separate company, not embedded in a particular battalion. That's where you get this discrepancy. Also thinking about it, when you think of the amount of machine guns on um, the first day of the Somme, when the Germans were operating before they got to defence in depth and they wanted to hold one line and a strong one, then everything was pushed forward into the front line. You might have a regiment with three battalions. Two battalions might be in the front line and one in reserve. But you've got this separate company of machine guns. You could put all six machine guns in the front line, whereas a, a British battalion with its embedded machine guns, they're you've got one battalion in line with two machine guns. So you've got a discrepancy there. You've already got more machine guns able to be brought to bear in the German defences than the British can use because they've only got two embedded in per battalion. Um, and this brings us back to 1915. The British are on the offensive. And they need when they're going across no man's land, they need to get their machine guns. They need that automatic fire up with your troops. You can't really carry a Vickers machine gun, like we said before, forward with your advancing troops. They take time to dismantle, they're heavy to, to, to move around. They're much better sighted without being moved as such. And in October 1915, Two things happened that gave the British the opportunity to increase their offensive machine gun power. So in October 1915, the British created the Machine Gun Corps. They basically removed their machine guns from the battalions, from being embedded in the battalions, and formed separate companies of machine guns, just basically like the German pattern, really. <clears throat> this gave them the opportunity to use their machine guns almost like artillery, uh, using indirect fire into the German trenches. You, you didn't have that fire sat in your trenches with your battalions that would probably have to be left behind when your battalion advanced. But, but they also adopted a new machine gun, the Lewis gun, a light machine gun. This was invented in 1911 by an American who offered it to the United States Army, but they rejected it. So we came over to Europe and worked closely with 
in fact the Belgians and the British small arms company to develop this gun and it was adopted by the British Army in October 1915 and they started issuing it to their units in early 1916. Now this is a, a light machine gun, you can see it's different to the Vickers or the MG08. Biggest thing is it's air-cooled, you no longer have with this gun a big jacket to keep topping up with water um, and to carry around your water with you and keep topping it up. It's also no longer belt fed. This one is has a drum on the top with 47 rounds in it. It also has like a, a, a rifle stock and a pistol grip and it can be fired from that bipod, that uh, two leg bipod there laying down on the ground or on the move, you can fire it from the hip basically. And I have seen at least one source, I think it's only one, where someone fired it like a rifle from the shoulder. Um, it's a lighter gun, it only weighs 13 kilograms, so much lighter than a heavy machine gun. Um, rate of fire is the same as a Vickers, uh, up to about 500 rounds per minute. Its range is a bit short, it's an effective range of 800 meters, and its maximum range is 3,200 meters. But all in all, you can take this up um, with your soldiers, can get across no man's land with this gun, and it gives them that automatic uh, automatic machine gun fire when they get across into the trenches. If they're getting counterattacked, then you've got this Lewis gun with you. Um, you've got your Vickers gun behind you, they can't get across, but you've got your mobile automatic fire. Like I say, early 1916, the, the British started to sort of equip their battalions with it, and by, by 1917, um, a battalion might have 36 Lewis guns, about one per section, uh, like two per, to, uh, per platoon. The Germans also realised that they needed um, some more mobile firepower. Don't forget, in 1916, they are on the offensive at Verdun. And when you get to 1917, they go to defence in depth, which is basically, it doesn't matter if you lose your front line, you send your counter-attack uh, counter troops in to reclaim that line. They also needed mobile automatic fire. And they produced the uh, MG08-15 in 1915. Looks very similar to the MG08, and that... It's not a coincidence, it is basically an MG08 just adopted to a more mobile role. It also has a rifle stock and a trigger and it has the bipod. Um, also on here you'll see there is a um, ammunition, canister, ammunition canister that can be used with it. But in all intents and purposes this is still an MG08 stripped down a little bit. It's still water cooled, it's still belt fed. And to be honest, it doesn't weigh much less than an MG08, um, the gun itself. Um, so it wasn't, um, so it's about 18 kilograms instead of about 26 for the uh, basic gun on an MG08. Um, it was the biggest, um, most produced machine gun of the German army in many ways at the end of the war. But it was still a heavy, bulky gun to carry around. Um, a bit misguided, really. They um, tried to adopt something that really wasn't that good, too heavy in the first place. Um, so, yeah, the Germans also wanted something lighter, and this was their attempt at it. Um, I think, hopefully, that's given you a good overview of machine guns on the Western Front. There is one other thing I want to talk about, and that is the use of these light machine guns, especially the Lewis gun. Um, when I did my um, video on the Western Front and I spoke about trench lines and defence in depth and the Hindenburg line, um, I briefly mentioned Passchendaele, only in passing. And Passchendaele was an unusual battle uh, or area on the Western Front because the water table was so high you couldn't dig down trenches. And although I'm here during the Passchendaele offensive by the British in 1917, the Germans had defence lines. Their defence was mainly centred around concrete bunkers, pillboxes, as the British termed them. They were dotted all over the Eat salient, and the British basically had to get past these um, little mobile forts. They were bunkers, 
where troops were sheltering, almost impervious to shell fire. So you couldn't rely on the artillery to knock them out for you. So on the um, during the Passchendaele Offensive, you've got a whole host of little forts spread all over the battle zone. And they had to be taken one at a time, really. And this is where the Lewis gun comes in really handy. Um, British tactics have been changing since 1916. And instead of these massive lines of men advancing across no man's land, trying to take as much as they can, the British have come up with bite and hold tactics, which you took a little bit, you had a small objective, and you consolidated before going further on. This basically negated a lot of German counter-attack tactics, and they tried three or four tactics, um, the Germans, on the each front to overcome these new tactics of the British. Um, and also, the section or the platoon was the sort of like fighting force of the British. They the sort of initiative would dissolve down and devolve down to that side of the that sort of size unit. So to attack a um, pillbox, um, you would have the Lewis gun advance towards the uh, pillbox and pin it down with frontal fire. Now a lot of these pillboxes didn't have um, firing slits on. Some did. Most of them were blind. They were just big bunkers where the troops could shelter in, and then they had to come out to fight from the flank, from um, uh, shell holes, or fire over the top because there's a big firing step at the back of some of them. So you pin that pillbox and its defenders with your uh, Lewis guns from the front, and then your riflemen and your bombers with their grenades would whip round the flanks and take the, take the pillbox from the back. That's how much, how different, how much different the British Army is from 1916 to when it's fighting at Passchendaele in 1917. Um, and I think I shall leave it there for today. Um, I'll probably do a video on all the small arms on the Western Front. But uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed that video. It took me a lot of getting through it, but there's a lot to say. And it's still, I haven't still said everything. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Please give us a like and subscribe. Check out my other videos on the Western Front. And we will see you soon. Bye.